Um, we're going to be talking about um, HIV stigma today um, and overcoming some of those barriers. Uh, as far as conflicts of interest, I don't have any to declare. Um, and this presentation was collab uh, created in collaboration with um, SA Metro Health and UT Health San Antonio AETC. Unconscious bias disclosure, uh, SCAETC recognizes that language is constantly evolving. Um, and while we make every effort to avoid bias and stigmatizing terms, we acknowledge that unintentional lapses may occur in our presentations. We value your feedback and encourage you to share any concerns related to language, images, or concepts that may be offensive or stigmatizing. And your input will help us refine and improve presentations, ensuring they remain inclusive and respectful to participants. So our objectives for today are to first define stigma um, and identify its impact on HIV patient provider interactions, uh, to recognize the traumatizing effects of stigma in healthcare on physical and mental health. We'll touch a little bit on trauma-informed care and understand how people first language can reduce stigma and improve patient and provider experiences. Um, and then Hopefully, we'll get familiar with the End Stigma, End HIV Alliance, or ESHA, anti-stigma guidelines, and identify ways to implement um, anti-stigma and trauma-informed care into healthcare practice. And so with that, what is stigma? Um, stigma is defined um, as discrimination against an identifiable group of people, including marginalized and non-marginalized groups and includes broad social and cultural factors, including power relations, community values, and historical practices. Stigma can be fueled by certain prejudice or stereotypes, um, beliefs about certain persons or groups that are viewed or presented as factual that carry a negative connotation. And they're usually widely held beliefs that are considered normal in a culture. Uh, an example of that would be if someone believes that young black males are more likely to commit crimes. Um, these beliefs can lead to um, discrimination, and discrimination are the actions we take based on those beliefs. And so there are lots of groups and people that experience stigma. This list is just a few. This is by all means not all. Um, but certain racial and ethnic minority groups, people who identify as LGBTQIA+, people with disabilities or large body sizes, uh, people with certain health conditions, right, including HIV or hepatitis, people who experience homelessness um, or are houseless, uh, people who have substance use disorders, or people who have experienced incarceration, um, and people who may have or seek certain medical procedures or treatments. And there's different types of stigma. It comes in many forms, and it's experienced by many, many people. So uh, people can experience different types of stigma, and sometimes the categories or types of stigma they may experience overlap. And this is referred to as intersectional or layered stigma. So individual stigma would be when someone internalizes the perceptions of others or of the public. They adopt those beliefs and apply them um, to uh, themselves or to certain people or certain conditions. Um, an example of this would be a patient who's diagnosed with an STI, right? Um, this is something that I see almost every time I'm at clinic where you diagnose someone and they believe they got the disease because they were quote unquote sleeping around or being wild or stupid. Um, so that's a good example of individual stigma. Community stigma um, are the judgmental attitudes, beliefs, and mistreatment by groups, social networks that include family, peers, coworkers, all those supportive um, groups that we need around us, right, to be successful. Um, and an example of that is someone who may be ostracized by their family or social groups or even healthcare providers because they refuse to get a COVID vaccine, right? Structural and institutional stigma are where programs and policies and practices um, that are institutionalized lead to discrimination or perpetuate stigma. And an example of that would be criminalizing gender affirming healthcare for transgender people, people or criminalizing um, the discussion of gender identity or sexual orientation with patients. And stigma can be conveyed verbally through our words or expressed through our body language, looks or attitudes. 
And people can experience stigma through association, right? If you associate with a stigmatized person or group, the old saying, birds of a feather, right? Birds of a feather flock together. This is referred to as courtesy or associative stigma. And it's a type of stigma, um, definitely requires more study, but it can affect um, friends, family members, um, or even um, care providers of people who experience stigma. And then one thing I did want to know is that stigma is not always intentional. So who might experience stigma in healthcare settings? Anyone, anybody. But some groups may experience it more frequently than others. And the things that perpetuate stigma include knowledge deficits, fear, personal beliefs or discomforts, um, education or lack thereof, societal norms and expectations, um, social culture, workplace culture, right? And peer culture, all of these things can lead to and reinforce stigma. And the impacts can be traumatic, long lasting and far reaching. On an individual level, people may experience shame, fear of, and belief that others are judging them, right? They may internalize those beliefs and isolate themselves. It may lead to hopelessness. Um, it, they may even start to impose those internalized beliefs on others, right? And perpetuate stigma themselves. For communities, um, people may experience the loss of their communities. So their support systems, they may experience rejection, isolation, um, and they may experience harassment, discrimination, and violence as well. And then institutionally, people may avoid or not seek care when needed, and they may not even get help if they've been victimized, right? Um, and they can experience loss of jobs, housing, education, or other opportunities or assistance that they uh, badly need. And so um, it can affect people who live with HIV um, by causing them to feel like they need to conceal their status. They don't want to be shunned or stigmatized by others. And that fear of disclosure can prevent them from accessing care and treatment for HIV. Um, patients may be unwilling to take medications, especially in view of other people. Um, that concealment can lead to social isolation and internalized feelings of self-loathing and a cycle of hopelessness. So stigma and discrimination lead to acute and chronic stress, which impacts our mental and physical health. It impacts our access to care and the quality of care we receive and therefore perpetuates health disparities and inequities. Uh, note, uh, people who do have peer or family support are less likely to experience these disparities, but it's still something that very many people experience. So it's really, it's really, really important that we address uh, HIV stigma in healthcare because reducing that stigma around HIV is how we're going to end the epidemic. We want people to get tested. We want them to get into treatment if they test positive. And we want them once they're in treatment to stay in care because U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. And negative experience in healthcare, um, it could be something that they've experienced recently or something that they've experienced in the distant past can really make or break whether or not patients get tested, seek treatment and stay in treatment. So true or false, stigma and judgment can be expressed through body language and looks as well as verbally. And you can put your comment in the chat or unmute. True. It is true. Patients um, often indicate that they feel judged or even stigmatized by providers based just on looks or body language um, and even the way they were treated in addition or on top of the things that providers actually say. So we do have to be careful how we carry ourselves in these situations because patients pick up on that. So we'll talk a little bit now about trauma-informed care. Um, what is it? It's a universal way to interact with people who have experienced trauma. 
Um, according to CDC, the majority of people um, in this country have experienced some form of trauma. Um, and so it's taking the perspective of asking what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. So it takes, it, it makes it such that the person, is, there's not something inherently wrong with the person, just that they've experienced something negative that's affecting them. It's based on five principles, um, which include avoiding re-traumatization, promoting safety, avoiding triggering or causing anxiety, being sensitive to power differentials and allowing people to speak out. Um, and then once they are allowed to speak out, having a system in place to address and follow up on problems and complaints. It uh, uses the event principle uh, when responding to traumatic events. And so event stands for empathize, validate, equalize, normalize, and trust. So we wanna show empathy to the person and validate them and their experiences. We wanna treat them as equals and as the experts of themselves. We wanna normalize their experiences and then we develop trust by respecting personal and professional boundaries. Um, if you are interested in more on trauma-informed care training for your organization, um, you can let um, everyone, or you can let Rodell and Maria know um, and they can provide you with some resources. So words have power, right? We all know this. Um, so it's really important to carefully choose the words that we use. Using people first and anti-stigmatizing language is one uh, way that we can do that. So person first language puts the person first, not their condition or diagnosis. So for example, Jack is not homeless, but a person experiencing homelessness or houselessness. Joan is not diabetic, but a person diagnosed with diabetes or a person living with diabetes. John is not a COVID patient, but someone diagnosed with COVID-19. And Jill is not an intravenous drug user, but a person who injects drugs. And you can see how it puts the person first. Um, there's some other terminology that we use uh, or may want to consider. Um, instead of using addiction, right, we can consider using substance use or compulsive behavior because the term addiction itself can be stigmatizing. And the same thing with homelessness. Um, we may consider people without housing or people without homes instead of calling them homeless. So some frontline communication tips that we can use in the healthcare setting right now today. Um, when addressing patients, we can avoid using gender terms like sir or ma'am, which I know is difficult in military city USA. Um, it's kind of ingrained in all of us um, to call people sir or ma'am, but what we can do is make the effort, right? To try and change that paradigm. So instead of saying, how are you today, sir, ma'am? We could say, how may I help you today? When talking to coworkers about patients, we can avoid pronouns and other gender terms, um, or we can use gender neutral words such as they, and never ever, or never ever refer to someone as it. Um, so we could say your patient is here in the waiting room or they are here for their three o'clock appointment. We can use terms that people use to describe themselves. So mirror your patient's language. If someone uses the term transgender, don't turn around and use a different term to address them. Mirror what they are using to you. And then only ask for information that's required. So in any given situation, ask yourself, what do I need to know in this situation right now? And how can I ask that in a sensitive way? All right, so another true or false. Healthcare provider bias and stigma are not very prevalent and they don't make a significant difference in patient engagement. If the patient cares about their own health, they'll be engaged. Is that true or false? I think they're all saying in the chat false. Okay. With exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely false. Thank you. Um, yeah, when patients have positive experiences in healthcare and with their healthcare providers, it leads to increased involvement in care. Traumatic and stigmatizing encounters, on the other hand, do affect future experiences. They carry that with them into the next experience that they have, and it affects their willingness to be engaged in care. And stigma that's experienced by patients in healthcare encounters can lead to shame, guilt, denial depression, right? Increased risk behaviors, 
avoidance of the healthcare system altogether. Um, so they're not getting the needed tests and screening that they need. They're not disclosing their risk behaviors. They're not showing up to appointments. They may not be taking meds as prescribed. They may drop out of care or never ever enter care. This is gonna lead to worsening of their health conditions um, and continued transmission of infections to partners, unborn children, and children during childbirth. And so it's really, really important that we develop trust with our patients. And part of that is meeting them where they are. Remember that your patients are the experts of themselves. We may be the expert of whatever type of care we're providing, but they are the experts of themselves. We need to accept and respectfully mirror the language or terminology that the patient may use when naming their body parts, disclosing sexual orientation or gender identity, or describing sexual acts or risk behaviors such as uh, drug use or sex work. Um, also assess the level of health literacy in your patient and assess it. Try not to prejudge or assume. Um, use language that your patient can understand. Supplement your teaching with pictures, videos, or whatever is helpful to the patient as far as the way that they learn. And then I always fall back on the teach back method. It's pretty tried and true. I tell them the information and then I ask them to tell me how they understood it. Um, and that way you can ensure that you're both understanding things the same way. Avoid assumptions. This is so key. Do not assume. Approach each new encounter as a clean slate, right? We haven't done this before. This is brand new. Don't assume you know a person's story. Don't assume you know their gender identity or sexual orientation. Don't assume you know how they want to describe themselves or their partners or their activities. Don't assume that all your patients are heterosexual and cisgender, right? Um, or that you know what a transgender person looks like, right? Um, according to the 2015 US Trans Survey, only 40% of transgender people were actually out to their healthcare providers. And don't assume your patients are or are not sexually active. Communicate. Explain to your patients why you're asking the questions you're asking and why they're relevant to what they're being seen for. Um, an example, if a patient comes in for their physical, you may need to explain that knowing their gender identity, substance use history, or sexual behaviors is important to ensure you're recommending the appropriate screenings and preventative care. This also helps to gain trust. And now that you know, how do we change our practices? So individually, we can counteract stigmatizing messages. We can educate ourselves, educate our patients, and speak out when we see something or hear something that is stigmatizing. We can use trauma-informed person-first language, committing to using words that humanize people, remember person before situation. We can use judgment-free language when we're taking a sexual history and substance use history. And yes, it does take practice. Um, you can not celebrate negative results um, or convey anxiety about positive results, right? We don't wanna do either one of those things. We can recognize our own emotional patterns, biases, triggers, um, and be really mindful of our body language. We can address the needs of the person. Does it matter how they got an infection? Not really. Ensure the patient feels safe in the exam room Foster that environment of trust. Be an active listener. Congratulate the patient for staying or re-engaging in care. And convey to patients that you see them than, as more than their diagnosis. And treat them with respect and as the experts of themselves. In the clinic or workplace environment, we can create welcoming and inclusive environments. We can create a shame-free zone, right? Shame's not healthy. It's not a motivator and it can exacerbate internalized stigma. We can hold each other accountable. All members of our team play a role in creating this welcoming and um, non-stigmatizing environment. Um, the patient's experience begins long before they make it to the exam room. So everybody has to be on board. We need to use correct names and pronouns with all of our patients and include options on registration paperwork um, and provide opportunities to indicate how patients would like to be addressed. We can cultivate shared decision-making and collaborate with our patients on realistic goals for their care, because what's important to me, the healthcare provider, may not be important to that patient right now. 
Um, and we're probably not going to get very far if we're not addressing what's important to them. On an organizational or structural level, we can formalize anti-stigma training. We can become certified in trauma-informed care. We can promote trauma-informed care and person-first language. Again, hold each other accountable. We can prioritize peer support and warm handoffs. So in, in the instances where we have the option, use patient na navigators or care managers. And if you're referring a patient to another provider, give that provider a call and let them know they're coming and why. Um, they, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing more annoying, I think, to a patient than to have to go tell their story again to someone else. When you referred them there, you could have given them the heads up. Identify a referral network um, that includes supportive and inclusive and in, uh, trauma-informed care providers. Um, and then find some anti-stigma champions in the workplace that brings in that buy-in at all levels of the organization. And then track your successes and your barriers and um, use the data to continually improve care. And finally, on a policy level, join the In Stigma and HIV Alliance and attend their meetings. You can join the South Texas Trauma-Informed Care Coalition. You can contact your clinician ambassadors, that's myself and Diana Morales, uh, with questions and for scheduling um, academic detailing sessions to help implement the uh, ESHA anti-stigma guidelines for the workplace. Um, pediatricians can sign up for free IPACE training, which is um, it's, uh, adverse childhood experience training um, for pediatric providers and uh, become a champion and teach others about anti-stigma and trauma-informed care. And then use your network to improve care and reduce trauma and stigma in healthcare. These are the resources used to create this presentation. And these are some resources where you can get more information.